All right, so Rabbi Aaron Cohen from Manchester, thank you for joining me um, in, this, uh, in this conversation. I was just saying you and I met several times in the UK. Uh, I believe the first time was in Liverpool when you were kind enough to come down from Manchester and we shared a stage together, gave a, gave a talk in front of a, uh, a small audience uh, during the Labour Party conference. And um, I believe it was either Sukkot or Simchas Torah, but I remember you came down uh, with your strimal and the whole holiday, uh, um, the whole holiday regalia. dress, dress or galia, <laughs> yes. It was, it was the night after. It was the night after Sukkot, yes. But we were still, we were still dressed with the, 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 the holiday, the Yom Tov. Yes. Yes. <laughs> And, uh, and we had a good conversation afterwards, and we've been had a lot of good conversations since over the last uh, couple of years. Um, but I, I think maybe it might be a good idea, if, uh, if you don't mind, uh, just talk a little bit about your background, about yourself. You were born in the UK. Um, is that right? That's correct, yes. I was born in, born in the UK. UK. I was born in London. My father, my late father, was born in Manchester okay. uh, over 120 years ago. And that's, uh, that's was quite, Not really. There was quite a thriving community in Manchester at that time. Really? A from, was it a from community? Oh, yes. There was a from community. Oh, I didn't know. And that. he grew up in Manchester. He was one of the first pupils of Manchester Yeshiva, which started in 1910, approximately, 1911. Oh, I see. Uh, and then he got married. My mother came from London, and, uh, and she was born in Poland, but she was brought up in London. And he got married, and soon after his wedding, after his marriage, he moved to London. And I was born, uh, I'm the youngest of three. Uh, I was born in, in London. And um, I had, uh, it was interesting, I was born still in, in the, uh, the, um, the Chinuch, the education of the Jewish education has developed in England very much since the Second World War. Which, this is as a result of the refugees who came over to England from Europe and escaped from Nazi, the Nazi um, <clears throat> conquest at that time. But I was so in my early years, I went to just a public school, as you call it, a non Jewish school, and then the uh, the Orthodox Jewish school started in the middle of the Second World War, and uh, so, so I'm sorry. So, so there. when you say when you say public school in the UK, it's different from the US. It's the opposite. Public school in the UK is actually a privately run school. It's not a government school, right? No, no. When I said public, I meant public. So I you went to a regular to secular to, public school. I a went to a regular school. secular school. That's where everybody did. Uh, All the Jewish people, even even the Orthodox from Jewish people, they had to go to the normal school, and we used to go to Cheder in yeah. the afterwards in the evening. But then, but that was of course it was it was wasn't ideal. But then the um, uh, the, the a proper Jewish school started a private school, which is going to this day. So it was the first one that started in. North London, and that's why I, I went during the Second World War, and uh, and since then, of course, I was educated in the uh, in, in the from schools, in the Orthodox schools, and then afterwards I went to Yeshiva. You know, I, I I studied in there was a famous Yeshiva in London. Uh, that same Yeshiva, the present Chief Rabbi of Yerushalayim, Rabbi um, Rabbi Weiss went to the same yeshiva, he's a bit older than me, but he was in the same yeshiva. And uh, afterwards I went to yeshiva in Gateshead, you've heard of Gateshead? Uh, that's um, a town where there's a big yeshiva in, in England. Uh, and, and afterwards I was just very briefly, you can spend a long time on the history, uh, afterwards um, I, uh, when I left yeshiva, I was for a sh two years, I was a shoychet. Um, and uh, Shrekhet. Then, Shrekhet is a butcher. Not exactly, no. No. A butcher, the bu a shalchet is a religious. They, it, it, they, they, the shalchet performs the uh, the, the slaughtering, the religious 
religiously required slaughtering of um, uh, livestock, which is uh, had to be done. It's almost like a rabbi in itself. Jonathan is like a rabbi. Uh, the butcher, of course, takes over afterwards when the when the livestock has been slaughtered, and they and then the butcher starts. But um, uh, but before that, it's a, it's a, it's a very it's a religious situation, a religious duty. Let me ask you, if you don't mind, what 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 year were you born? Um, I, I usually keep it secret, but I'll tell you. <laughs> 1936. You were born in 36. Okay, I'm just trying to get the perspective. So you're saying <laughs> that the religious education, the religious education, came after school, up to World War II, then after World War II, and the refugees. And I, I'm assuming you're talking about the the Frum, the ultra orthodox refugees came from Europe, the the yeah. survivors. So then they developed a stronger, uh, you know, uh, a, an ultra orthodox Jewish education system. No, they were actually just we went survivors. I'll just tell you very briefly. There were quite a lot who were also survivors, of course, but they had escaped Europe before. Oh, the before the war. war. Yeah, 1939, a lot came in, and then during the actual war, they couldn't, very, very few, a few did manage to get here, but they couldn't get there during the war. But then immediately after the war, there were a lot of, as you now describe them, survivors, and they, they blew uh, new life into the Orthodox Jewish life in England. Yeah, I say the same thing uh, I believe happened here in America, in New York. When yeah. Yeah. The Satmar Rebbe came, and others came following him, and they, suddenly they developed uh, Satmar and other other okay. yeshivas in New York, and that's that's really when it when it started. Was it the same in the UK? The same process. Yeah. Mm. And uh, well then uh, afterwards, I, I was actually for many years, although I carried on being very closely involved with rabbinical duties and teaching, but I was in. In commerce, I still am actually <laughs> to a degree, in for many many years. But that was um, that's the way I earned my living. But um, uh, but all the time, my connection with with, uh, with shul and synagogue and teaching and so on that carried on very strongly. So yes, that's, that's my life. Yes, and then um, the context in which you and I met, which was only two years ago. So historically speaking, it's not. Uh, that significant, but you were very much involved in the Torah Karta and the anti-Zionism and the conversation about anti-Zionism. How did you get into that? How did that develop uh, on your end? Yeah. You've heard of um, Rabbi Joel Teitelman, Satmarabi, you mentioned him just before. Yes, yes. I was introduced to his tea. I grew up in an orthodox environment in Yeshiva, very strongly involved in learning Torah, but we didn't, we weren't involved at that time when I was a student, when I was a yeshiva bacher, as they call it, um, we didn't get too much involved in that. Um, but then um, we knew about the, um, we knew about the uh, Satma Rebbe, I mean, you know, more or less from the distance. Um, we didn't get too closely involved in his views and his ideas. But then when I was a very young uh, young man, in the early 20s, I, I was, I met somebody, it would take too long to go into the full history, but I met somebody who was very closely involved with the, the views of the Sattva Rob, and he introduced me to them, and I became very much impressed by it. And the, the whole teaching of the Sattva Rob, and, and that started already 60 years ago. Um, and all over those, all the years since then, I've been followed the teaching, tried to follow the teaching of the Satmarov and his views of anti Zionism and the, 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 the fallacy in Zionism and the wrongness of Zionism. And, and um, I'm sorry, did you say that you actually met him or you were just introduced to his I've teaching? I met the Satmarov a number of times, yes, yes. In yes. the UK or, or in New York? No, I didn't. I could have met him in New York. I'd I would, somehow or other, I, I regret it now, actually, but I didn't, wasn't so much pulled to go to New York to meet him. But I met him and he came, he came to England um, on a, a number of occasions on his way from New York to Eretz Israel. He went by ship, he never went by air. 
and he used to stop off on the way back and he stopped off in Belgium for a few days and he stopped off in, in, in you were 1952 and then uh, so I didn't see him then Came again around about 1915 when I I saw him then I heard him talk mm. and he came again in in 1959 uh, uh, again I uh, heard him and then in 1960 uh, I'm getting mixed up with things in uh, 19 um, yeah in 1950. Uh, I, I, I'm used to the... the, yeah, the, the you can say the Jewish years and we can do the math later. The Jewish year, right. Well, in, in Tovshin Chofei, now it was 1965. Okay. That's right. That's the last time he came to um, England. And so how, that time I... And so how, um, how was this imparted to you? What did you hear that you thought was uh, compelling about his... Because he was really the, the strongest most vocal anti-Zionist rabbi probably in the world at the time. And maybe, I don't know that anybody has matched his, uh, his fervor to this yeah. day. So, he was but it wasn't separate from his, from his religious fervor. In other words, he didn't see it as separate from his, um, his very strict lifestyle and the very strict uh, schools that he'd built and the very strict kind of uh, <laughs> demands that he had from, from, from Jews, from his students. The anti-Zionism was part of that. Am I, am I right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So how was that imparted to you? How was that? How did you, how, what did you hear that you found compelling? I heard what to me sounded like the truth. <laughs> he, he wrote, uh, he, he wrote a big safer called Mayol um, Moshe, which you yes. have possibly have heard about. But uh, but his his views they made sense. The whole yes, that, right? the fallacy. Uh, I believe this yes. is it. Uh, well, um, yeah, that's right. Yes, that's it. That's the one. <laughs> and uh, that 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 and um, his Magnus Opus, as you might call it, uh, he uh, Magnum Opus. And he, um, th that is very, one goes through that, it's very, it's not just a secular uh, political view, it's, it's very, his main thrust is that it is against the whole, the, the whole idea of Zionism, it's against the teaching of the Torah as has been handed down to us through the years. We are on, on a number of fr a number of um, fronts, mainly uh, as he starts off, because it's against our emuna. We are taught that the um, the, the Jewish people were given Eretz Yisrael, but subject to uh, as they were promised Eretz Yisrael at Sinai, at Sinai, which we're celebrating tonight, uh, tomorrow night. Shavuos is the, the time when the Torah was given to us at Sinai. And included, not, 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 I often bring this point out that with most nations, and they're, they're tied up very much with their land. The land is an intrinsic part of their identity. With the Jewish people, the identity is established by Torah, not by the land. But a part of the Jewish teaching is that we will, would be given and were given and will be given again, hopefully, all being well. The, the land of Eretz Israel, but only subject to certain conditions. And um, these conditions are that we have to, this is all brought out very clearly in, 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 in it's, 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 in, in the, it's um, in, indicated in the uh, scriptures and also in, and taught very clearly in, in, in the oral Torah, which was given us together with the scriptures, with the written Torah, that the, the Eretz Yisrael would be given to us subject to certain conditions, and certain subject to us living our lives, certain standards. And if we didn't maintain those standards, then we were told that we would be, would, we'd be it's quite clearly written, we would be going to exile. 
And the Jewish people were in Eretz Yisrael for approximately 1,500 years from the time of the, the, the Mount Sinai revelation until approximately 1,500 years. And, but the, sadly, although there were many, many very, very great examples of uh, righteous people within the Jewish people, but it, as a whole, the standard was not up to what was expected of us. And we had to go into exile. And that's, that is what has happened. History confirms that. Jewish people have been dispersed to the four corners of the, of the globe. And um, part of that teaching is that we had that exile is not just something that took place. It is a, um, it is a, a divine wish. It is a wish of a Kodesh And we are told, and that's what is taught very strongly by Rabbi Sadman, but it's taught, taught in earlier and very many other sources as well, that the Jewish people were put under oath not to rebel against the requirements of this exile. We were taught to live in exile, live as good citizens in all the countries in which we find ourselves, including Palestine, including Israel, because once we were dispersed from Israel, we no longer had a right at that time to any control or in Eretz Yisrael, but we could live there, but only as as members of a civil civic society, and um, we're told we have to live our lives according to uh, decent lives and, and according to the uh, requirements of the people in charge at that time. So I don't understand. So if that so, but but after two thousand years in exile, um, and after the. Holocaust, which we'll discuss later. I'll ask you about that later because I think that's important. But um, what's wrong with Zionism? I know why not allow the Jewish people? Maybe it is God's will. Maybe why is Zionism not seen as the will of the Almighty to as a path for the Jews to return to their homeland? Good question. The, the, the answer is, is that. Uh, included in our teachings is the way in which the exile will come to an end. This is taught to us, shown to us by the Rambam, Ramonides, and the exile will only come to an end when it is the, the time, when there is a revelation which will tell us what that the uh, uh, heavenly revelation which will tell us when the exile is coming to an end. And at that time, when it does come to an end, it will come to an end with the willing cooperation. This is a very important point. A willing cooperation of all the nations of the world. We say in our governing, in our prayers, Yakiru v'yedu k'yosh v'seivel. All the dwellers of the world will recognize that that everybody will recognize the rule of God. But that's, that's a special time which we are praying for all the time. But that, it, it, no way is the, are we allowed to take it. We are under oath not to try and come out of exile with the efforts of our own hands, with military force, or, and, that we're, and we're warned that we're under oath not to do that. And, um, and we are warned that if we try and do that, there will be dire consequences. And in fact, Rabbi Tatelbone says quite in his teachings that that is one of the causes of the Holocaust of the First Second World of the Second World War. That uh, that's his view, I mean, which which he says quite clearly that as a part of the punishment for trying to come out of uh, exile. Um, uh, under our own efforts, and we had to suffer. Yes, that is you. Whatever it is, in any case, will come. As we said, we'll mention the Holocaust. That's certainly that the Holocaust is the wish of a Kodesh Baruch Hu. It took place as a wish of, of the Almighty. But Rabbi Teitelman says it is a direct result of our trying to come out of exile under uh, uh, through the efforts of our own hands. So, all so let me ask time. you. Let me let me let me just. Uh, um, so to talk. When did you become involved with Natura Carta? When did you? When did you become involved? Because Natura Carta is a is a whole other commitment of of uh, activism 
besides the religious life, besides the daily religious life, the Torah Karta also takes on, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the Torah Karta takes on a whole other aspect of actual activism uh, okay. about Palestine Zion, and Zionism. Can you tell me about that and about your, your involvement? Uh, well, let me just go back a little bit to see. Uh, people often ask me, what, is, what about the Torah Karta? And the Torah Karta really is the name of a concept. It's not the name of a movement. It's the name of a philosophy. The name of the philosophy which is held by Orthodox Jews who oppose Zionism absolutely. And that opposition, the name of the, that opposition, the concept of that opposition is called the Turek. It was given the name, the Turekata. The, you, 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 the, the, it was, that name was coined about uh, 90 years ago in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, uh, at the time when um, the Zionists, as you know, there was a, an, an original issue in Eugene going back hundreds of years, and they were very opposed to the new nationalistic and secular um, um, uh, movement that brought about the influx of the uh, Zionists into into Israel going back so hundreds just, of years just, ago. I'm sorry, and just to then, clarify, so you're talking about the older Jewish communities that existed in Palestine before the state of Israel, before Zionism, were mostly right. a, 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 a religious communities, if I'm not mistaken. They were mostly, they were, I would say, oh. they were in almost 100%. They were yeah. a very strong religious community. And they were in Hebron, and, and Jerusalem, and a few in Tiberias. So you're talking about them, that community that existed before Zionism and before the state of Israel. Yeah. And they were religious communities. And they, they, they opposed very strongly the new um, pioneer movement, pioneer nationalistic movement and its effect, or particularly if they were concerned about its effect on the youth and their interference in religious institutions. And at that time, they, 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 there was, um, they, they set up the battle, a battle against Zionists and that, and they called themselves Maturi Carter, the name Maturi Carter, literally, you may be familiar, Maturi Carter is not Hebrew, it's Aramaic, Aramaic, and it means the guardians of the city. And it goes back to um, a story told in, in our teachings where uh, somebody came to the uh, town and said, uh, who are the guardians of this city? And uh, they, they pointed out to him uh, the, the soldiers or the police. He said, no, they're not the guardians. The guardians are the wise men and the righteous men who tell you how to conduct your lives in the right way. And that coin, that name, the Turi Carter, was formed and they adopted that. The, um, the, 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 from the Orthodox people in Jerusalem at that time adopted the name, the Turi Carter, and that has stuck in various forms. But it's the name of a concept, it's the name of a philosophy. It's not, a, it's not a one movement, the Turi Carter. So when you ask me how I came involved, well, as I said, I, I, I came imbued with the teaching of the, the Satma Rav going back 60 years ago, but I, was, I wasn't a, a activist. Uh, I, was, I, was, I had the view, and very strongly the view, but I, can, I, I uh, just carried on living my own life, as it were, until approximately 20 years ago, actually. Um, so that went on like 40 years, 40 odd years. And then, um, I heard of Rabbi Beck, who you've met, yes, who lives in Monsey. He's, he's not well at the moment. Oh, you met him in London when you were there. You remember he was there. He, he I met him in Monsey and you met him in London. Yes. That's right, yeah. Anyway, um, and I got involved, I got close to him for a number of other reasons. I, and I'm very impressed with his, um, with his, what I call his truthfulness, his, his um, his ability to look at things straight without um, not being imbued by any side side influences, and um, there was an occasion when he went um, to Washington with a number of colleagues uh, who are around still today, Rabbi Weiss and others, and they went to Washington. This is going back about almost twenty years, and they they joined in a Palestinian pro-Palestinian um demonstration he his 
his view of it, and this leads this will lead us on to the Holocaust business. His view was that you have to join in in order to show that we sympathize with the fact that the Palestinians have been um, have been uh, uh, have been uh, um, oppressed and and that op that oppression is in itself a chilul Hashem. That, that oppression is in itself a chilul Hashem because we're not allowed, first of all, from a religious point of view, as I mentioned earlier, from a religious belief point of view, we're not allowed to try and impose ourselves in any country. We have to accept the rules of the country. But apart from that, there is, there is the humanitarian aspect of it, the fact that the Palestinians have lived in Palestine for hundreds of years, and to impose yourself upon them shows itself in the eyes of the world as being callous and being and, and having no consideration for people's lives and livelihoods. And he, that in itself was a chilul Hashem, that in itself was a profanation of God's name because people look at us as being orthodox and trying to do what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants and here we come along and Jewish people come along and do such activities which are, are oppressing other people and that is a Chil Hashem and his view is very, was and still is very strongly that a tension between Jews and, and, and Muslim, Jews and Arabs, and by reducing tension you save lives. So his view was, number one, you have to remove the Chil Hashem, number two, you have to do what you can to save lives, both Jewish and non-Jewish, and the way to do it is to show sympathy by joining in the um, demonstrations. And he did this. And it raised a it was it raised a real fury. It was a terrible fury. And in the Jewish press, in the Orthodox Jewish press, they um, insulted him in a most terrible manner. And I saw it at that time, as I said, I, at that time I hadn't been an activist. I was very strongly sympathetic, but I had not been an activist. But I saw this terrible this terrible insulting approach to Rabbi Beck and his colleagues as if they were the scum of the earth and there were adverts in the Jewish in the Jewish Orthodox press criticizing him in the most lowest manner possible and at that time I I couldn't stand that because I knew Rabbi Beck personally from previously I knew that the kind of insults that they were throwing at him were totally untrue and I wrote a letter to the the Jewish Tribune, there's a paper in, in, in London called the Jewish Tribune, you might be familiar with it. And I wrote a letter and set out, in short, the whole approach of Rabbi Beck. They didn't print it, I didn't expect them to print it. <laughs> but why, was there such, why, was the, why was there such strong resistance to him doing this? Why, what, was the, what was the cause for the oh, yeah, it's, resistance? <laughs> why? It's, it's a, it, that, you ask a very good question, why? I, I mean, I've often tried to analyze it. They, they, you see, the, as you know, when Zionism first came into existence, it was opposed by both Orthodox and non-Orthodox Jews. It was, it was, a, it was a min very much a minority movement, but they it gained, it gained momentum, particularly during the First World War, and this momentum brought about a situation where both, well, certainly non-Orthodox Jews, but even Orthodox Jews became very impressed with the idea, as a result of earlier because of pogroms in, in Europe, but, but certainly because of the Second World War, and they became very impressed by the idea, and they began to conflate that idea with the requirements of Orthodox Judaism. They forgot that the two are separate. And, um, uh, and um, 
So th they became very impressed. And as the generation, don't forget, it's a long time now. I, I remember as a child when the, when the state was formed, how uh, the euphoria that gripped people and they forgot. They didn't want to look at how the state had come into existence. The, the euphoria, I remember my, my own late father, who was a very great man, my very great father, but he, that particular point, he was very, and other people, very much gripped by the euphoria of, of, of we Jewish people have actually got the ability to take over, to, to run a military and to take over a country. It couldn't, it couldn't, it couldn't grapple with that idea, but it became very much part of them, of them and others. And that has developed, that has developed as the years have gone on. And therefore, if somebody comes along, as Rabbi Beck did, and started criticizing and undermining the whole idea, they, were, you, you, they couldn't take it. They couldn't, they couldn't, although they were Orthodox Jews in other ways, they could not gr grapple, and they still can't grapple with that idea that it is totally wrong in every way. Now there's a lot more people understand it, but at that time... So, was he, so, so he was, so he was, so he was, the criticism against him was only from Orthodox groups who became Zionists, or also from anti-Zionist uh, uh, yes, yes, mainly the Orthodox groups who were sympathetic to so Zionists, and there are various degrees. You've got, you've got strong religious Zionists, like the West Bankers, as I call them, or you've got others, even ones, even, you've got strong religious Zionists, and you've got the, 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 uh, the, the, the the, the A Zionists, those who are not Zionists, but they, they're not so much against it. They're prepared to go along with it, either. Yeah. Some of them for more religious reasons, like Mizrahi, or maybe some just for, for practical, for pragmatic reasons. And, and then you've got those who are anti Zionists, in other words, they, they don't approve of Zionism, but they're not prepared to do anything active against it. And then you've got the Naturi Kata. Uh, and they couldn't, they got, they, they, they developed the idea that to go along in conjunction, in a demonstration, in conjunction with the Palestinians, was a, they called it a Chilil Hashem. <laughs> I still to this day don't understand how they can call it a Chilil Hashem. It, it was a Chilil, it was a profanation of their ideas, yes, but not Chilil Hashem. What was, there was in no way was, was anything being carried out. Chil Hashem means, we are taught Chil Hashem means when you go against the wishes of a Kodesh Baruch Hu, when you bring about, um, when you bring about degradation of the Jewish people and of a Kodesh Baruch Hu by not behaving in the right way. That wasn't the case here at all. But they called it Chil Hashem mainly because they had this, this sort of, developed nationalism which had been adopted by them they yeah. willingly or unwillingly and they'd attached it i called it bolting on they'd bolted it it on they had bolted it on to judaism i call it judaism plus they'd taken judaism and they the, in the i'm talking now about the religious zionists they bolted zionism although zionism as you know started off as a totally um irreligious movement and nothing to do with religion whatsoever. It's a nationalistic group. But they came along and they bolted yeah. Zionism onto Judaism. And I, they met, I, 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 I want to share a, 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 just a quick story with you. Yeah. I, met, I met Rabbi Beck in Muncie uh, and sat with him and Rabbi Weiss and I have a recording of the conversation. He spoke in Yiddish, Rabbi Weiss translated. This is before he had the stroke. And then uh, yeah. a couple of days after that, there was a protest in Brooklyn. Uh, with some Palestinians, <clears throat> I forget what the occasion was, and he was there, and I've got this great picture of him sitting there with his kaftan, with his Jerusalem, with his striped uh, coat, sitting there, and some young, you know, Haredi kids, all, you know, sitting next to him with Palestinian flags. Uh, it was a long drive. I mean, he came down for that protest, and then um, when I spoke to him, I asked him why he left Jerusalem, because he left Jerusalem after the six, 1967 war. Um, and he said to me, I don't, he said, and I, you know, through a translator, through Rabbi Weiss, he said, I don't want to grace their state with my beard and my payas 
in my coffin. I don't want to crown their state with my religious uh, presence, which I thought was a great answer. It was a really a powerful answer. Uh, but yeah, but I remember him coming to that protest. Uh, that was quite moving to see him there, you know, this respectable older gentleman, rabbi with his Jerusalem coat, with a striped coat. Um, it, was, it was really uh, quite a scene. So you've, uh, your activism has taken you to many, many, many countries, many interesting countries that one wouldn't necessarily, um, necessarily equate with Orthodox Judaism. Uh, one of them was Iran, I know that. You've also, I believe, been, been to Gaza. Am I correct? I, I personally have not been, I was going to. We were going to meet up with Rabbi Weiss and Rabbi Feldman, and I was in Egypt, I was in Cairo, and they, they and actually went, to this was in, and they went, they, and I was on my way <laughs> from Cairo to the border, and then the, the, my driver got a message that the security wouldn't let me go through the uh, go through the border. And but you I did go to Iran, them, but um, yeah. oh yeah, I've been a number of times to Iran. And one of those times, uh, so maybe you can tell me about some of those about some of those trips, and then we'll talk about the one with the conference that's become okay. so controversial. Well, but what other what other I'm, trips did you take to Iran, and why? I beg your pardon, can you repeat that? I'm saying, well, I, I want to talk about the particular conference, but first, if you maybe you can share some of the other trips that you've taken and why did you take those other trips to Iran? Okay, well, again, it comes into, into the context of what I mentioned earlier. That I was impressed by Rabbi Beck's view that we have to join in and show that we sympathize with the Muslims, with the Palestinians, uh, in order to, uh, to three things: number one, to remove uh, to remove Chil Hashem, to remove the blot that Zionism has placed upon the Jewish people, try and help them remove it anyway. Can't, can't, to work in that direction, and to um, uh, to save lives because it reduces tension, uh, and, uh, and and to do that, one had to. His view was, and still is, that one has to take every opportunity of showing that by joining him with the uh, Palestinian or pro-Palestinian activities. And I had become involved, as I mentioned to you, because of this letter I wrote to the Jewish Tribune that they, they roped me in. That's when I started being roped in actively with the Naturi Kata. And, um, uh, uh, and, and I went in, in London a number of occasions and, and spoke. Um, because I was brought up in England, um, I was able to speak easier in English than a lot of them. And uh, so I spoke in a number of venues in, uh, in London uh, and, uh, and around uh, also a number of universities. A um, number of times I've spoken in universities in, in all over the place in England. And then the, they went, uh, before I did, they went to Rabbi Beck and a few others were invited, and I, I can't quite remember how it came about, but they were invited to come to a conference, I think it must have been, in uh, Iran, going back maybe 2000, 2001 or two. And they went there, and they made a tremendous impression there when they went and, uh, and carried out the purpose which Rabbi Beck says we have to work for, which is to make a kiddush a shaman to save, to help save life. And then uh, there was an, a, a, another conference. They, they, at that time, under the president who was then in Iran, Ahmadinejad, he was very, he was very uh, keen in promoting various conferences which supported the Palestinians. And um, one of them took place and they uh, asked me to come along and be prepared to come to Iran. This was in 2005, uh, which I did. And at that time, we went to a number of places. Um, I spoke in a number of venues in, in, in Tehran and in, in Qom. And, um, and we met Jewish people there as well. It was very, very interesting, really. And we were able to see for our, with our own eyes the fact that the Jewish people are not oppressed at all by the Iranians, those provided they don't support 
Zionism, <laughs> that is. Um, and they were able to carry on their lives. And um, we saw that with our own eyes. We met Jewish people. Anyway, that, that was in 2005. Um, and then, uh, and of course, later on in 2006, the end of 2006, <clears throat> they got it into their heads <clears throat> at that time, wisely or unwisely, to, um, to, the, uh, to have a conference to discuss the Holy Course. They called it officially the, co <clears throat> the Holy Course Review Conference. And uh, do you want me to talk about that now? Or yes, yes. Yeah, please. Uh, uh, yeah, please, okay. go ahead. Yes. Um, yeah, he, they, they called it the Holy Course Review Conference. And they invited all sorts of people. Be, pro, uh, and they weren't afraid of inviting Holy Course deniers. Okay, we... we we didn't go along with that, but that's, we didn't organize a conference. They weren't afraid of inviting Holocaust deniers, and they, and they invited non-Holocaust deniers as well. But because they got a name, or because it came out that they'd invited a number of Holocaust deniers, it became, it, 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 it became identified as a Holocaust denial conference. They, they denied that that was its purpose. And I'm not going into what the real purpose was or not, but they denied that that was its purpose, but it became identified as a whole course in our conference. But they still invited us uh, to, to come along. And uh, we thought very carefully about it at the time. What do we do? It, we knew it, would, um, it wouldn't be approved of by a lot of people. But on the other hand, it was that's, that's an understatement. I'm sorry, that's sorry? an that's an understatement. That's an understatement. <laughs> understatement. You are you okay. were you are attacked okay. by Actually, vicious, I must vicious. tell you, I myself, because I, I wasn't so much involved in the news, I didn't realize how much it would be opposed. I knew it was something which wouldn't be approved of, but at that time, for me, it wasn't an understatement because I wasn't so much involved in the news at that time. But we did, it was discussed that we could go along and we'd have the opportunity of stating our case as far as Zionism was concerned. And this is what we looked at. We looked at it as, um, we looked at it as, a, um, as a high profile opportunity of spreading the word that Zionism and Judaism are two separate, different, opposing concepts, and that also the authentic Orthodox Judaism does not approve of Zionism in any way. And we thought, and we discussed it very carefully. I discussed it with, with um, very much, of course, with Robert Beck, but also there was, um, uh, there was um, another great rabbi at that time, he's not alive anymore, uh, I forget names these days, but he, 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 uh, he gave the go-ahead. He said, we should go along. Did Rabbi and, Beck, um, was Rabbi Beck part of the delegation? Did Rabbi Beck go? Um, no. He had been in an earlier delegation, but he didn't, he didn't come to that delegation. Not to my recollection, no. We had, I must tell you, before that we had been on a delegation to, to uh, Beirut. To a conference uh, for the in, in in support of the the return of the Palestinian refugees, uh, where where we were hosted <laughs> by the Hezbollah, and we were very very well taken. We were very very well received, and it was very successful at that to the, that, that particular delegation. And there's a there's a photograph of Rabbi Weiss and others standing on the Lebanon side of the border. <laughs> <laughs> and with it, very, very interesting. Anyway, then let's go. There's a lot to talk about that as well. But we came to, um, but, but we went along to the delegation there. And the idea was we would use that opportunity. We would, first of all, of course, vociferously oppose the idea of Holocaust denial. Um, because obviously, I, did you read my talk? I sent you a transcript of it. I did, did yes. I did, yes. Yeah. And, um, we, uh, we, we very much, uh, obviously, no way could we in any in the slightest indication of the Holocaust denial whatsoever. But on the other hand, the, the point we brought up was that 
the the um, the Holocaust as such cannot be used as a means of justifying oppression of the Palestinians, which is what the Zionists do. Although that's also rather hypocritical, as I brought out in my talk. But the fact is that that's what, that's what they do. And I stressed that very strongly in the talk that I made. And that was our purpose of meeting there. And we met many people at the time. Um, and we also met, we met Holocaust deniers. And um, <laughs> my view of the Holocaust deniers is, is very hard. There are all sorts of Holocaust deniers. There are those, I said, there are those, I suppose, who are motivi motivated by anti-Semitism. There are others who say they're not motivated, motivated by anti-Semitism, but they're looking for historical truth. In which case, if that's the case, they're just plain foolish. Because how can you, uh, how can you um, uh, deny something which happened in front of your very eyes? It's like the the, the, the flat earthers, as I I, 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 I compare them to. So, that, but, that, but I, I, I don't consider them to be anywhere near as sinister as the world has, has adopted. Not because I support them in the slightest, on the contrary. They're, they're, they're totally wrong and they're, they're either wicked or foolish. But, but, but in no way are they, are they to be taken so seriously as the world has taken and the, the only reason why they, they, I think they've been taken so seriously is because the Zionists have pushed for that because that's, they've got no other religion. They've got no other way. Their only religion is Holocaust support. Uh, so if anybody uh, uh, sort of tones down Holocaust, the, the opposition to Holocaust denial, you're undermining the whole raison d'etre of Zionism, which the Zionists can't take. But in fact, it's, it's, it's really a, a non-issue, uh, in, in my view. But that's just a personal view. But uh, when we went there, we certainly were, I would say, very successful in bringing out the fact that Zionism and Judaism are totally opposing concepts and that uh, Zionism is a blot on the name of the Jewish people and that is not the true, um, the, the true way of Orthodox uh, and authentic Judaism. And we feel that we were very successful with that. But in the eyes of the world, um, we had done something very terrible. We had shown support of people who were seen as being Holocaust deniers, which in itself was not true. We did, but of course you didn't show, you really didn't show support. And my, my, I wonder if the opposition to your presence there had more to do with the fact that you showed some kind of recognition, you gave some kind of legitimacy to Iran. In other words, it's not that the issue was Holocaust denying. Obviously, none of you deny the Holocaust. I mean, many of the uh, Rabbi Weiss and some of the others, their families uh, perished in the Holocaust. So, I mean, somehow the notion that any... any I had any, those who also perished in the Holocaust, yes. Everybody had. The, the, and so, yes, so the idea that somehow this delegation would support the Holocaust denier, but you were there, from my understanding at least, to state the case that Holocaust denying has no, uh, has no validity, has no legitimization, but your presence there in terms of the Zionists, in terms of all these other Jewish groups uh, in the UK, for example, like the Board of Deputies and, uh, and some of the other uh, Zionist groups, was that you gave legitimacy to Iran, and Iran is supposed to be the enemy of the Jews, and Iran is supposed to be the enemy of the Jews, of the state of Israel, where in fact Iran is the enemy of Zionism. But it seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that perhaps the opposition, and the very, very fierce opposition, I mean, you have uh, the, the opposition that came out against, against you and the entire delegation was fierce, uh, has to do more with the fact that it was a slap in the face of Zionism, or another slap, but a very high profile slap, because you gave some legitimacy to Iran as, as, as a government, as a country. May well be. I cannot deny that. That yeah. is true. They couldn't take that. They couldn't swallow that. Yeah. Um, but in fact, that's the case that we were making out that Zionism has no legitimacy. And uh, Iran's opposition to Zionism is correct. Yeah. And we, we made no secret of, our, yeah. of, of that at yeah. all. Yeah, I, I, well 
I, 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 I went to Iran as well, participated in a conference there and spoke in a very, a, a whole bunch, a few places. And then um, when the Israeli authorities heard about that, I was actually arrested and interrogated and questioned. They decided not to prosecute. I just received notice that they um, decided not to prosecute me, but they, uh, they interrogated me and the, and the uh, accusations were that I visited an, uh, a hostile Arab country. And I kept telling the, the police officer the, the, who was questioning me, I said, I did not visit a hostile Arab country. <laughs> Iran is not an Arab country. No. <laughs> but in their rule book, hostile and Arab go hand in hand. So that's what yeah. they had, visited Arab, hostile Arab country. I kept saying it's not an Arab country. But anyway, that was, that's, I think that has to do more than that. But um, to tell me a little bit about your visit to, to, uh, to Lebanon and, uh, and the visit with uh, Hezbollah. Well, this was prior to going yeah. to Iran. This was in 2005. Uh, there was a conference, as I mentioned earlier, uh, to discuss the um, uh, uh, the possibility of uh, the, the, of um, uh, of uh, Palestinian return to their. So what, was your, what was the position that you took there? We uh, same position that we take everywhere. We support that. <laughs> we said that you know, certainly the, the Palestinian refugees have every right to go back to their. To, to their place, and, and again, the main the underlying message is Zionism and Judaism uh, have no comparison. <laughs> I was paid afterwards the compliment of being quoted by um, uh, Mahathir, what's his name, from um, uh, Singapore? Not Singapore, from... Oh, yeah, 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 from, from uh, Malaysia. Yeah, Malaysia, yes, 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 yes. In, 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 in London, and he more or less <laughs> quoted my speech where he said he'd be very impressed by what I'd said when I was in Lebanon but um, uh, yeah we went there and we were treated very well I remember asking the, our hosts we were looked after security wise we were very well looked after uh, and it was by the Hezbollah and I asked one of the men, uh, one of the uh, people I said do you think it's a good idea that we came here and he said, it's a wonderful idea, it's an excellent idea. <laughs> he was most impressed by the fact that we came. And they took our group, but not me, for some reason or other, I had to come home earlier, but they took the rest of the group from Beirut, southwards, to the border. And there were photos of Rabbi Wise and Rabbi Beck, and I can't remember who else, maybe Rabbi Feldman, I can't remember. And a very interesting photo with them standing with the members of the Hezbollah on the Lebanon's sign, <laughs> um, uh, wonderful photo actually, um, but they, it was, it, it did, the main point is, it, it did what we were trying to do all the time, show that Judaism and Zionism are not one and the same, and that authentic Judaism understands uh, our job is to live in peace with the various governments of countries in which we find ourselves, we are in a divinely decreed exile we're not allowed to try and fight against it and uh, and we understand their suffering we understand their grievance and uh, and the idea behind all that is to produce a kiddush hashem and save lives that is the teaching which um uh, which we had, which we go along with excellent well, I think that's a good place to um, to end. It's been an hour, so and it's very late in in Manchester right now. So I really appreciate oh, your. No, I don't get very really. <laughs> <laughs> But nonetheless, is there anything else that um, you'd like to add that you think might be important to add, particularly about perhaps any more details or anything else about the the actual Holocaust conference and the Holocaust issue. I ask it because it's, it came up so many times, particularly in the UK, against Jeremy Corbyn, against some of Jeremy Corbyn's supporters, that they're Holocaust deniers, including myself, that I was somehow, not that I'm a Brit, but I was there. And um, so is there anything else that you think is worth shedding light uh, on this issue? And maybe particularly anything that had taken place during the conference that might be worth uh, mentioning? 
well, I think the, 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 I don't think I can add a lot of substance to what we've already said. There were various, the, the very, the general mood there was very receptive to us and supportive to us. I must say we we got on very well. Um, just, um, just uh, homing in just for a moment on 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 uh, Jeremy Corbyn. I I had. Um, tried a number of different opportunities to bring out the fact that we, and other people as well, that we had no opposition to him, and we think it's nonsensical, the, the accusation that he should be called anti-Semitic, anti-Zionist, yes, but not anti-Semitic, but it didn't help the, 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 the Zionist. It's amazing the power of what was, what was termed as the Zionist lobby, yeah. Uh, it's yeah. developed in this country and in the United States. Absolutely amazing. One of the puzzles, I call it one of the puzzles of the 20th and 21st century. But there's one other thing I want to mention, though. It's a different subject to go, something from what you, um, you, you, uh, you spoke to me about recently, or maybe in your blog. Um, the, what's going on, the battle that's going on, in the Zionist state, between the, the Orthodox, between the Haredim, as you call them, and the government, very strongly. And you've got <coughs> the, 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 the Turukata there, the Palestine, the Rabbi um, Shomer Hirsch, who I know quite well, we met a number of occasions. And, um, and their, their fights, their constant fight with the authorities there. I've got a personal view on this. This is, uh, I'd like to share it with you. It's not held even by a lot of the Orthodox people, but I've got a personal view on this. I think historically, the, 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 the Zionist development in Palestine goes back now a hundred years since, since the Balfour Declaration, since going back to 1920. And the, um, the fact is that um, once the Balfour Declaration, once the British mandate was set up, which was very much in support of Zionism and the Zionists, the Zionists had the Jewish agency at that time had tremendous power in Palestine. And they were given the keys, as it were, for immigration. And I personally think it's a terrible shame that this power they had was used by anti-Zionists as well to go to Palestine. In the 1920s and 30s, there were thousands and thousands of Orthodox people who went from Europe to Palestine. And I always say that they, they went. Um, and I'm not talking now about the old issue of which we referred to earlier, which had been there from earlier, but people who'd come, the new, so-called new issue, orthodox new issue. But I always say that they, there were three points. They came with the help of the Zionists because they had to have their certificates under the, uh, under the yes. British mandate, and that was in the hands of the Zionists. They're coming there at that time, 25 years from 1920 to 1945, help the Zionists because the Zionists needed manpower. They needed Jewish representation in Palestine because when it first started, there were 60,000 Jews against 600,000 Palestinians, which was uh, ridiculous. You can't make a state with 60,000 Jews. They needed more and more manpower. So everybody who went there, with orthodox, non-orthodox, Zionist, anti-Zionist, every Jewish person who arrived in Palestine actually supported, helped, not supported, helped the Zionist aim. So that's two things. They went with the help of the Zionists and they helped the Zionists. And the third thing is that they gave the, and this is very important, I think, they gave the impression in the world at large that they supported the Zionists. They helped build up the impression that Zionism and Judaism 
are conflated, which is what the world has adopted, and which is a, which is a tragedy of what's happened in this country, in the United States, and so on. Willingly or unwillingly, this is the situation. I often dream of what would have happened if the Orthodox people at that time had said, no, we, and there were rabbis who had that idea. There was the Munkacher Rabbi, I don't know if you've heard of him, Munkacher Rabbi, Rabbi. Uh, it was known as the Munkacher Rabbi and others. If they'd said from the 1920s onwards, we have no connection with the Zionist ideals. If we would love to live in Palestine. Every Jewish person wants to go to Israel. But we cannot have any connection with it because any connection with it will be taken as support of Zionism. And we should have no connection with no Jewish people, no Orthodox Jewish people should go to Israel whatsoever. I often dream, supposing that had been the case. Yeah. And furthermore, of course, at that time, there was the old issue of and nobody could blame them, them for being there. They'd been there before the, the, the Zionists. But when the state was formed in 1948, had the old issue of people said, OK, it's very sad. It's very, very sad that the Zionists have been so successful. But they have been. And we can't. And that's obviously something we can't do anything about. We have to go away from here. It's no longer our place. They wouldn't be able to all in one go. It may take years and generations. But had they adopted that attitude, that they, this is no longer our place, we have to go away. So there wouldn't have been the Zionists built up beforehand. And over the years, there would have been a gradual fade away of orthodox representation in Palestine. And then I say, had that had happened, first of all, the orthodox people would have had no problem that they have now because they wouldn't be there. <laughs> They'd have no problem of constriction, conscription. They would have no problem. You know, there were many problems, uh, religious problems. Well, in all fairness, they did try. In all fairness, they did try to separate themselves from the, from the state. And I know that they did uh, write to the British and to the United Nations to try to create some kind of a special status for, for themselves, separate. Yeah, that was before the state. Yeah, before the state. Yeah. They, they were quite right. Once it was that there, was, yeah. yeah. Dahan was assassinated for that very reason. Yeah. Professor Dahan, because yeah. he was very capable of being able to bring out that idea. But I'm talking about later on. I, I'm just a, sharing a dream with you. Yes. They, they, uh, they, 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 there would have been no problem. Although it would have been terribly sad that we have to leave over. I once said this to one of the great rabbis, who's not alive anymore. Why, why, how is it that people stay there and don't think that we should go away? He said, we well, can't leave everything over to the Zionists. <laughs> so I didn't argue with him. I, I didn't agree with him though. Why not? If that's the case, leave it. Don't show some, because you're very being there. Living in a state, even if you oppose it in every way, but the fact is you are using the political and financial and economic infrastructure of the state. You're using the military, which is the very symbol of Zionism. You have to use them because if, you, if there's a conflict between them and the Arabs, you can't live there without the military. And you're using them. And you, you, whether you support it or you wouldn't want it, it makes no difference. You are using them. And, so uh, had, uh, that been, had that been the case, there would be no problem for Orthodox Jews in Palestine because they wouldn't be there. And I su venture to suggest that the state would have come crumbling down a lot earlier. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> you know, the, 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 um, the, uh, I met, cause there, are, there are some uh, from the ultra orthodox community, Haredi community, that are leaving, and I met one here in the U.S. Um, a That's while ago. He, he left, yeah. Yep, and then he said, uh, "But this is a younger guy who recently left," and he said to me, "You know, he said Israel is no place for a Jew." <laughs> That's and, right. And then um, a conversation I had with Rabbi Hanan back in London. He was saying to me, "You know, they tell me that uh, I'm supposed to feel more secure over there than over here." He said, I've lived in London, in England for, I don't know, he said 35 years or something. He said, I don't know what a British soldier looks like. Over there, every child knows what a gun looks like, what a soldier looks like, and they want to yeah. tell me that it's not safe. But yeah, well, look, this is all, this is all, this is all, um, 
really important and, and, and great to hear. And I really appreciate your, your, you know, your thoughts, your thoughtfulness, and again, your, your willingness to speak to me. And, um, but I'll stop it here because we've gone beyond the hour, beyond one hour. Um, and again, thank you again. Uh, and perhaps we'll do this, uh, we'll do this again. Um, this, is, this is really important and very, very interesting uh, material. So I really, really appreciate it once again. And I wish you all the best. You too, Mikko. <laughs> you know, you remember we had a, a basic, very basic discussion in, in Rabbi Gallandau's house, remember? Of course. of course, of course, of course, of course. How can I forget? I think about it quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much and a good night. And sei gesund. You as well, sei gesund. All the best to you. All of it, thank love. you. Thank you.